Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome back for another week. Yes. Um, how's everybody doing? Hopefully good. And I'm doing wonderful. Did, um, wait, did we get any advice on Nathan's name? Because it's Gina, Shannon. Um, I think Mr. Garlic Man said to call him Ghost because we can't see him. Oh, there we go. Ghost Nathan. So... Ghost Nathan, Ghost Nathan, Ghost Nathan, <laughs> Ghost Nathan. <laughs> if you guys could only see him, just wait till we get, just wait till we get him a, a camera. Um, I just want to touch a little on why I'm so happy right now. Um, Shannon's household might not be so happy right now. <laughs> why? Um, I got a text message last, I don't know, Friday or Saturday, and it said it was from her husband and it said oh. uh how much do you got on the game i'm a steeler fan he's a raider fan we played on sunday against each other so i said 100 bucks he, and he, this is him <laughs> in the background she sends the text 100 bucks he goes i what is she some kind of baller <laughs> like 100 i was thinking like 10 bucks will i sound cheap if i like tell her like 10 bucks i was thinking 10 bucks <laughs> you know what i said to him don't embarrass me back up your team <laughs> i was like i was like well you know i mean put your money where your mouth is so i said um i said are you scared <laughs> and he said you know what i'm the one that reached out to you that's so his fault a hundred bucks it is <laughs> But I do have to say that the week prior, the Sunday prior, the Steelers played the Cowboys and we lost. And so I lost that bet. Um, that one wasn't for money. I would definitely have rather it been money because my boss tortured me for an entire five days. The entire <laughs> week he put... <laughs> he put like a, a printed out paper with like the final score on my computer um yeah it was just like in the in the drawer next to my desk he put like a star <laughs> like it was torture and then they photoshopped me onto a dallas cowboys i don't know if it's if, was it a cheerleader or like I think a, it was just a I just think it was like a, a fan yeah like some woman the- wearing like all kinds of cowboy gear so they photoshopped my it was when, torture. When you sent it to me, I thought it was you really there at first. I was Everybody like, oh. thought it was me. And I'm like, people, look at the tattoos. This I this know. woman has bare arms, okay? I know, but your first reaction is like, oh, who got her in a cowboy outfit? <laughs> yeah, so. And when was she at the game? So I, <laughs> so I really needed this win, you know, to get me out of my funk. And you got it. And might I add, I never, ever ever bet on my team i never bet on my team really and nope. you did so one thing you know i what? always taught my wait kids a... don't ever bet on your team but wait a second they won they did so, so i don't know what that maybe means. you need to bet on your team more often i don't know maybe i'm just get, you know what i'm gonna take the win and walk away <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. And the, the $100. Same, yeah. The, the same thing that I would do if I was gambling in Vegas and I won. Collect my money and I'll I'll catch you later on the flip <laughs> side. Yeah. I'm not going to be greedy about it. So. Yeah. So. But, you know, this, this was a good, this was a good football weekend for me. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was fine for me too. Yeah. Apparently <laughs> not, like, apparently and mind not you, my husband. I, I haven't said anything to her 
at all. I didn't text her. No. I didn't say anything. We did not. And me and Gus did not talk, text nothing during the game. No, and no then after happen. I was like, hmm, is he going to text me? Is he going to text did me? Did he reach out? Nope. He just zelled me. <laughs> did he? Okay, good, good. He just zelled me. He sent me the money. And then... um. He said something like, oh, it's going to be a really long season. Like, I'm really, I'm really upset right now. <laughs> so he wasn't He's, too happy, but. But that's the life of a Raider fan. I'm going to have a lot of you come after him, but it, that is the life of a Raider fan. Yeah. And that's so. what happens when they move to Vegas, the Las Vegas Raiders. Like, come on. Yeah. I can't. Well, that's what happened when they left Los Angeles. They've been cursed ever since. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, back to true crime. I kind of chose this story because it, it happened very, very close to here. And I kind of remember when this happened. Um, this is the story of Jasmine Fiore and she was on a lot of reality shows and unfortunately lost her life. But I remember this happening like in real time. So Jasmine Fiore was born on February 18th, 1981 in Santa Cruz, California, and grew up in a small community of Bonnie Dune. Have you ever heard of that? I had, and I had to Google it, even though it did say that it was outside of Santa Cruz. I had never, ever heard of this place. I've never heard of the city before, and I've lived here all my life. Yeah, and Santa Cruz isn't that, I mean, it's a drive, but you know, it's kind of in central Northern California up there. Yeah, but, but I I've just never even heard of this before, this place. Yeah. So, which I thought was was crazy. So, she was your typical California girl who had a huge smile. She was very energetic and radiant. Jasmine had a very happy childhood. According to her mother Lisa Lapore, she was just a great kid. She's a lot of fun. She was smart and she had an agenda. You know, this is a girl we called General Jasmine when she was three. The girl woke up, had a plan, had like all kinds of stuff going on from a little start. I just picture her like marching around giving orders in the house. That's how I pictured her. Like bossy, kind of like my Jasmine. Maybe it goes along with the name. It's with the name. My daughter's name is Jasmine and she's a little bossy, little bossy buns. So her friend, Sarah Jansen, who met Jasmine when they were both in the fifth grade, described her as exciting. She brought a new lease on life to us. She was a beautiful girl, and she knew that could take her places. She wanted big things in her life, and she was going to get them. She wanted to be famous. She could reach for the stars, and she could actually obtain them. She was exuberant, said Gwendolyn, whose two sons were in school in California with Fiore, and who was a mother figure to her. She was radiant. She was gorgeous. Every man I ever knew that ever saw Jasmine, because there was that inner beauty as well as the physical beauty, they fell in love with her at first sight. I mean, she might as well have been Marilyn Monroe reincarnated. She was focused and ambitious. Everybody had such good things to say about her. Yeah, she... um she sounded like, I mean, she, when you look at her smile, she kind of had like one of those like contagious smiles where if, when you look at her, like she's a beautiful girl, oh, but you just like, she just looked like she would be a fun person to be around. Oh yeah. So Jasmine was a swimsuit model who frequently worked as a body painted model at parties for entertainment. She appeared in shows at Las Vegas casinos. She had acted in commercials such as adult chat line commercials. Jasmine had also obtained a real estate license and was about to open a gym and a personal training center. According to Jasmine's friend of a year and a half, Marta Montoya, she had a longstanding but intermittently serious relationship with Robert Hasman, with whom Jasmine wanted to settle down. Another man in her life was Travis Heinrich, who she met around 2005. The couple had become engaged and remained so for less than a half a year in 2006. Although they broke off this engagement, they continued to date. It kind of sounded like they remained friends, but still hung out or something. Like, yeah, I, and, I don't think it was just dating. Like, I think they kind of hung out as friends and right. she would lean on him and reach out yeah. to him when she needed to so talk. So they stayed, they stayed close, it sounds like. Jasmine had met Canadian-born Ryan Jenkins at a Las Vegas casino shortly after Ryan had completed filming Megan Wants a Millionaire. 
And if you guys remember, that was a really popular reality show. This is at the time when like VH1 was like cranking out all yes. these reality shows. The Rock of Love. Rock of Love, yes. Yes. It was during all this time. Britannia they were was out. my favorite. I was the biggest Britannia fan. Never saw it. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. I loved her. So two days later, on March 18th, 2009, the couple married at the Little White Wedding Chapel on the Las Vegas Strip. You're cute. You want to go get married? Yeah. Like, I, yeah. We're having great chemistry right now. Yeah, let's, we're having great chemistry. Let's we haven't sobered married. up yet, but we're, it's great. <laughs> Things are working out wonderfully. According to a casting producer for VH1 at the time, Ryan, a 32-year-old real estate developer, had one of the best personalities on this planet. He had a cocky charm about him that won over the team who produced the show Megan Wants a Millionaire. Basically, this was just a girl that went on there that basically wanted to date a millionaire. That was the premise of the show. So so the casting notice called for men who had a net worth of a million dollars or more. At the time, reality shows were popping up everywhere on TV and were quite successful. However, there was not a standardized vetting process for contestants. VH1 hired the company Collective Intelligence to run background checks. However, they relied on accurate information that the contestants themselves gave, such as previous addresses where they lived. It doesn't sound like they were doing much checking. No, so like they would run background checks based in the cities based off where the people would put their previous, right. you know, addresses. So if I left off an address because let's say I had a warrant or I had a, got convicted of something in, let's say San Bernardino yeah. and I left off that address and I was only putting addresses in Oklahoma and Texas or wherever else I lived. Yeah. They, they were running yeah. checks yeah. nationwide. I, I don't even, I'm not even familiar with the system, but I don't even think it sounds like they had a system where it was uh, right. nationwide yeah. to check. You well, would have to I, actually check in the cities that these people lived. But I also think when you have like, I mean, obviously if you're going to do a reality show, you're going to want to do background checks. But I think because this one involved money, that's, that's like another, you know, I don't, I mean, how do you, you just ask people for their bank statements or like, what do you do? Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, you didn't have to have a million dollars cash, but you had to have like property, property things, something that, something that would show that you right, were this millionaire, would, but it didn't sound like they amount really to a million. No. check the amount that these guys. Yeah. Cause spoiler, made. Ryan didn't have a million dollars. No. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Ryan and Jasmine had a rocky relationship from the beginning. Dan, Ryan's father, said that Jasmine was his son's only friend in California and that she would disappear for days at a time and lie about it to his son. According to Jasmine's mother, Lisa, Ryan was very jealous of Jasmine's friendships with her ex-boyfriends and they would fight all the time. She also claims that Jasmine had the marriage annulled in May of 2009. However, there are not any legal documents that support this claim. I think it's a little weird. I'm just going to throw this out here. Um, I think it's weird when you stay friends with your ex. I guess it depends on what kind of relationship you had beforehand. And I mean, obviously it depends why you broke up, but like, yeah, I mean, especially if you're in a new relationship. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't. Why be that close with your ex? Yeah. Like, why would you stay friends? Like, for what reason? It probably wouldn't be a reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I talk to my ex-husband, like, I don't know, once every seven and a half years or something. Um, and that's just because we have kids. <laughs> you know what? I'm probably around that, too. So, <laughs> But I'm so just saying, I just like, I just, yeah, I find I just, it really weird when people are like, oh, yeah, you know, we're still friends. We still hang out. Like, you can be cordial. Like, you don't have to be hateful. I'm just saying, like, when people break up and they're like oh yeah we're gonna go hang out and have lunch you know next week like where, really maybe some people are just better off being friends and they realize that like hey guess, we have a I better mean, relationship as friends but when you but when you start going into another relationship i think that's probably when you should cut off yeah. ties with your ex yeah only because i mean i just feel like that could just cause problems yeah. jealousy or not like i just think that that's weird that's yeah. like a weird thing you know to hang out with them anyway Court records in Clark County, Nevada, stated that Ryan was charged in June 2009 with battery con constituting domestic violence for hitting Jasmine in the arm. 
This, so this relationship escalated quickly. So they met in March of 2009. Yes. We're married two days later. Yes. And then we're April, May, June. He's already showing signs of being abusive. Yes. Okay. Travis Heinrich, who was present, said Ryan and Jasmine had been arguing over their over her friendship with him. See, I'm telling you, it just doesn't work. Which resulted in Ryan hitting her arm and causing her to fall into a nearby swimming pool. Ryan was to go on trial in December. The pair had reconciled shortly at, before Jasmine's death and were reportedly traveling to San Diego for a poker game. Investigators reported that the couple checked into La Auberge Hotel in Del Mar, San Diego on the evening of August 13th, 2009. You know what else I found really weird? That's the day that Shanann Watts was murdered. August 13th, 2009? Yeah. Not 2009. Oh, but just the but same. August okay. 13th. August yeah. 13th. Like that's just, you know, sad. Not a good day. Yeah. They were to attend a poker tournament, a charity fundraiser for the Karma Foundation at the Del Mar Hilton. Surveillance video captured the two leaving the Hilton around 2.30 a.m. on the morning of August 14th, 2009. The couple were later seen at the Ivy Hotel, a nightclub in downtown San Diego. Jasmine was not seen alive again. Around 4.30 a.m., Ryan returned to the hotel in Del Mar alone. Ryan left the hotel around 9 a.m. the following morning on Friday, August 14th. The next morning, Saturday, August 14th, Jasmine's body was discovered about 7 a.m. Her badly beaten and crushed body was discovered inside a suitcase inside a dumpster in an alley in Buena Park, California, which is a hop, skip, and a jump from here. Friday, he leaves the hotel and her body is found Saturday, Saturday morning. morning. According to Buena Park police, her teeth and fingers had been removed before her nude body was stuffed into the suitcase. Do you know, like, I mean, not that I know, but I'm just saying. <laughs> she probably knows. I don't, but I'm just saying. Can you imagine what it would take to remove somebody's teeth and I mean, their fingers? You got to use pliers of some sort, I'm yeah. sure, to like just sit there and like yank yeah. people's teeth out and cut like. That's crazy. This man was very disturbed. She had also been strangled. Authorities believe the mutilation was an attempt to impede identification, which obviously. So it was not until four days later on August 18th that her remains were identified using the serial numbers from her breast implants. That just goes to show you the beating that this poor girl took. Yeah. To not be able to identify her, um, which is I can't imagine being her family <laughs> and having, you know, having to deal with that. Yeah. The Orange County Coroner's Office reported Jasmine had died a couple of hours before her body was found. So she was not so, dead for very long when she was found. In the so she was still alive then when he left the hotel room that morning. Yes. I would guess. Yeah. And he probably beat her to a pulp to where she was out. Mm hmm. And when she came to again, that's when he decided to strangle, strangle her, her. Yeah. And then remove everything from her. Right. That's disgusting. It's awful. It's it's just, it's a terrible story. You think like by this age, this, he hasn't, he had never like shown any signs of this before. I feel like somebody that kills like, like overkill or like, you know, crimes of passion or whatever, you have to, I feel like he would have to have had something in his past that was just more than, you know, like running a red light or something. Uh, so her white Mercedes was found abandoned in a parking lot in West Hollywood, about a mile from the penthouse that she shared with Ryan in the Fairfax district. Police reported that there was a significant amount of blood and some evidence of hair pulling. Ryan reported her missing on the evening of August 15th at 8.55 p.m. This is a day after this man they found is a her body. lunatic. Yeah, this is a day after they found her body. But they hadn't identified her yet. Exactly. So he's like, oh, he's she like, just oh, went with missing. I did good. I cut her fingers yeah. off. I yanked her teeth out. Like, no one's going to identify her. No one's going to know who this girl is. And I'm going to report her missing now since it's yeah, been long enough. It's been no, 48 yeah. hours. My girlfriend's gone now. Let's report yeah, my her wife. missing. My wife. My wife. Sorry, my girlfriend. Whatever. <laughs> So Ryan told the police that he last saw Jasmine about 8.30 p.m. on August 14th at their home. Ryan said they had gone to San Diego for a poker event and that after returning, she dropped him off that evening and went to do errands but never returned. 
there's video footage of her never even leaving the hotel. The hotel. So around 9 a.m. on August 16th, 2009, the day after reporting Jasmine missing and after spending some time packing, Ryan was seen leaving their penthouse for the last time. Police said Ryan went to Nevada to pick up his speedboat. On Monday, August 17th, when contacted by police, Ryan said he was in Utah and was headed to Canada to resolve some immigration issues. On August 18th, Jasmine's body was identified and the murder was first reported in the media. In the afternoon of August 19th, Ryan called his father from Birch Bay, who informed him Jasmine had been found murdered. The Whatcom County Sheriff's Department received witness reports of Ryan's black BMW SUV towing a boat towards the Canadian border. Police later found the BMW SUV and an empty boat trailer at a marina in Blaine, Washington. The engine was still warm. So, and I just want to say too is that your wife is missing, but yet you have to handle immigration issues in Canada. Like, I mean, that what could smell what could suspicious. possibly be more important than your wife missing at this Gone point? Missing. Like, oh yeah, I gotta go. Um, you know, make sure my passport's up to date. Yeah, I wonder if that's his dad trying to cover up from him. But look, she would disappear for days at a time, and. You know, not tell him where she goes. So maybe. Yeah, that's true. I mean. Or he was just setting up the story. I mean, yeah. Who knows at this point? Who knows? So at the time, Ryan was only a person of interest in the investigation and had not been charged. Though Canadian authorities had been alerted to watch for him. U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Customs and Border Protection did confirm they had boats patrolling northwest Washington waters looking for Ryan as early as Wednesday, August 19th. Initial media reports were that the U.S. Coast Guard and Canadian authorities chased Ryan's speedboat as it crossed to Point Roberts, but these reports were later denied by officials. On August 19th, a man matching Ryan's description was seen piloting his boat into a marina in the border town of Point Roberts where Ryan's stepmother lives. The Royal Canadian Mountain Police announced that they believe Ryan crossed into Canada sometime between August 19th and August 20th. On August 20th, Ryan was charged with Jasmine's murder and an arrest warrant was issued. Also on the morning of August 20th, Ryan called his father who was detained at the airport. So his father had to hang up the phone call. At about 6 p.m. on the evening of August 20th, Ryan arrived in a silver PT cruiser with a young blonde woman at the Thunderbird Motel in Hope, British Columbia, Canada. The car had Alberta license plates. They pulled up beside a dumpster rather than pulling up beside the rooms, which the motel manager claimed to have found strange. Ryan stayed in the car while a young woman paid cash for three nights accommodation. The manager described the woman as attractive, about 25 to 30 years old and very calm and making some small talk when registering. The guests in the room next door said the woman stayed for about 20 minutes with Ryan in room two and then left the motel. The woman was never seen again. I think she was a paid I don't think it was a friend. I don't think she no. knew who she was harboring, but I think he hired her. Of course. Yeah. Of course That's he did. My, yeah. Yeah. The manager saw Ryan walking outside the motel the next day on August 21st. The manager said Ryan looked exhausted and he was not recognizable from his picture on television. Yeah. It takes a lot of effort to rip people's teeth out and cut their fingers off. And to live with the guilt. Guilt's ugly on people. Yeah. You can't sleep. Murder, guilt, ugly. At 11.30 a.m. on August 23rd, the couple failed to check out. Having noticed very little further activity over the weekend, the motel manager and his nephew decided to check on the room. Ryan was found dead, apparently of suicide. His body was found hanging from the walls, clothes rack by a belt. No suicide note was found in the motel. A one-page suicide note saved on Ryan's computer titled, titled last will and testament and dated august 20th was found by police so he didn't have the suicide note on his body but he had left it in his computer yeah and it was dated on the 20th so he had this plan when he went over there he oh yeah he knew exactly what he was was doing yeah yeah on august that's the day that he was charged with the murder correct yes it was so and when he found out his father was detained at the airport had then he was like he knew like game over yeah i'm done On August 27th, the investigators found a storage unit full of Ryan's belongings, including a suitcase of clothes in Washington State. And I just want to say, that's a chicken shit way of going out 
after you've murdered somebody without having to pay a price. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Like if you're going to murder somebody, you have the balls to murder somebody, like fucking face the consequences if yep. you get caught. Yep. Oh. Following the announcement that Ryan was connected with the murder of Jasmine, VH1 put Megan Wants a Millionaire on a hiatus, which was at that point had only aired the first three episodes. Yeah, so and like, that's what I remember. I remember it just coming to like an abrupt halt, like no more. And then that's when literally like it was just every day like bam 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 like news. she like she was found dead then her body was identified then all of a sudden he's dead then like it was just it was so quick that i remember it all happening yeah but yeah it's and the megan it came on like it premiered like august 2nd yeah so this so this premiered and then he it, decides yeah you know not too long after yeah you know, not even what two weeks later a week later he's murdering yeah. his wife yeah you know in the premiere, Ryan described himself as a little bit of a Prince Charming and a little bit of a bad boy. Megan Hauserman, the star of the show, who was looking to marry a millionaire like Ryan from day one, even though there were some red flags. Yeah. They, the Just a red few. Flag, yeah. There was a big red flag that he was not a millionaire. He actually wore a fake Rolex watch and came to the show with only one pair of pants for a five-week shoot. Yeah, I mean, the guy probably couldn't have afforded a Happy Meal, which, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, we've all been there. But, but I mean, don't, you're going to go on like Megan Wants a Millionaire and claim that you have at least a million dollars somewhere. With fake Rolex watch. <laughs> That's just embarrassing. Like, don't even wear a watch. Like, yeah. Why just, even? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, oh. yeah, I don't but, know. But she said he was really sweet. She looked him up on Facebook during filming and was carrying on a secret relationship with him off camera, talking to him on the phone at night. She actually told him at one point that she was going to choose him. Megan admitted that Ryan came close to being the winner of the show, but the producer strongly discouraged her from choosing him. Obviously, somebody saw something for them to tell her, like, don't pick him. Yeah, they were like, no, no. Well, yeah. they said, like, during his interviews that he would hold, he um, he wasn't a favorite among the viewership. Mm. Like, they just didn't think that he was going to be one of the favorites because he wasn't doing his interviews very well. He yeah. wasn't very liked. And they said that the viewers would not like the choice if she chose him. And so for her to strongly rethink her decision. Well, they did say that he was, like, really cocky. Yes. And so I... I wonder if that's why, you know, he kind of was coming off, came off to the with viewers. that attitude. Yeah. She ended up sending Ryan home. Megan said that Ryan was really upset and that she was upset also. But she figured after filming, she would get in touch with him and they would meet up afterwards. However, when she reached him, he told her that when he left the show that he had met someone in Vegas and ended up getting married. And she thinks it was because like, you know, sh he was pissed and he wanted to win something. So he felt like, yeah. You know, he I'll found show this beautiful, you. yeah, he found this beautiful yeah. girl in Vegas and ends up marrying her. Yeah. The day after Ryan's death, VH1 officially announced the show was canceled and also announced it would not run the third season of I Love Money, which was reportedly won by Ryan. Although this cannot be determined, however, because Ryan tried to pick up his honorarium check of $5,200 a few days before Jasmine's body was discovered. It subsequently emerged that Ryan had not only been charged with assaulting Jasmine, but had been convicted two years earlier for assaulting a woman in Calgary. So he did have a history of this, but assaulting somebody and murdering somebody are two uh, yeah, huge I, differences. Yeah. I Even mean, though that's a red flag. Uh, well, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Neither of these incidents have been disclosed to either VH1 or to Megan Wants a Millionaire producer of 51 Minds. According to Collective Intelligent, Ryan Jenkins' criminal record in Canada escaped notice as a result of an error by a Canadian court clerk. So that's what they were relying on, were these court clerks looking up this information if these people had records. Well, and not only that, I mean, can you not get your record expunged? Oh, not I guess the, not that I have. <laughs> not a that I have. Of, a lot of these things Gina knows about. And we're <laughs> just wondering. Hmm. No, I'm just saying, like, if you expunge your record, right? You get your record expunged. I know that it's not gone forever. Like, it's still, it, it's still there. 
but I don't know what steps you have to take to actually like find, find it. it. It's not, I'm sure they, if, if he expunged his record, I'm sure they wouldn't have found anything. And it doesn't, I don't feel like they were doing deep dives back then. Cause no, 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 of course not. I always feel They're like checking, our society know. is reactive, not proactive. So uh, until something happens, then we'll figure it out. You yeah. know, I just feel like steps they could have taken to keep contestants safe. They weren't really taking because they figured this stuff doesn't happen, but it does. So since then, there are extra precautions when vetting contestants. It took years for the, um, for the collective intelligence to grow back their business. They were, it was, they were extremely damaged by this. Oh, of course. Because production companies didn't want to use them. But now they, they're used, I think, by um, a lot of like Big Brother and things like right. that. Right. They have made a name for themselves again, which is probably, they're probably the safest ones to go through because yeah. they actually felt the impact mm-hmm. of it. I think they came after them for millions of dollars because these shows had to get canceled. You know, Yeah, of course. People still had to get paid. So, no, you know, that's... I just really think that they would probably be the best bet to go with because. No, of course. This, but, of course. Yeah. Megan, who's now happily married and living in Florida with her husband and young son, says she still looks back on her time on the show fondly, even though it ended horribly. I think I had the most fun anybody can have in their 20s, she says. It was a once in a lifetime experience. Asked if she thinks that there's anything that could have been done differently to prevent Chaz- Jasmine's murder, Megan is thoughtful. Who knows? I mean, if I didn't talk to him outside the show, maybe he wouldn't have been so upset and run off and married a stranger. She says, maybe if he didn't get cast, you can't really say. I think it was just like this sick storm. As for the casting producer for the show, who remembers thinking there was something about Jenkins that gave him pause, he says his gut feelings about candidates are louder today, and he always listens. I'd rather be wrong than end up with another Ryan Jenkins. But it's funny, that same casting producer was the one that said he had the best personality on the planet, too. But they did feel... As the show went on, that there was something kind of about him, and yeah. they didn't want him to get chosen. So. Yeah, and you can't, you know, like for Megan, like you can't. She can't live with that forever, and what a should you know? Yeah, I mean, things. if yeah. we did that, we, you know, be in our heads all the time. But yeah. I'm curious if the man she's married to now is a millionaire. <gasps> Good question. I'd even look that up. Yeah, I'm really curious yeah. to see what his you know, financial statuses. statuses. So did she actually did Megan get her millionaire? Yeah. I wonder, yeah. but Who that knows? yeah, but it's really sad for Jasmine and her family. She was a really beautiful girl, had a great personality and yeah. no one, no one, we, we do this all the, we talk about these cases all the time and no one deserves. Yeah. No, this is, you know, going out like that, like awful. Just, yeah. So, yeah. Um, on another note, before we say goodbye, I wanted to ask anybody out there, or you, I don't know, or even you, Ghost Ghost. Nathan. Ghost Ghost. um, Have you guys heard um, that Tupac's still alive? Oh, yeah. I've heard, yeah, for a while now. Like, there's been rumors that he's still alive. Have you seen videos of this man that's claiming to be Tupac? I have not. I have not gone that far, no. Have you? Because you are a Tupac yeah, that's Man, Tupac's like my boy. Yeah. Um, Has he called you? No, I've changed my number since the last time I talked Ooh. to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but see, in all honesty, um, I was I was on TikTok, and this guy's video came up, and it's this man claiming to be Tupac, and um, it's. <laughs> It's it. Uh, my initial reaction was like, "There's no way. Like, it doesn't look like him." But again, it's been almost thirty years that since true. since he died. And I do have to say that if he looked as close as anybody did about the guy who looks like Snoop Dogg on TikTok, when I go through mm-hmm. TikTok, you've come yes. across that guy. Yes, he, like dance move everything. Like yes. he is like Snoop Dogg's twin. Like no joke. Like I was like Snoop yeah. Dogg. I thought I was actually. Snoop Dogg yeah but you didn't get that reaction from this one I didn't but then when um this person who put this video up 
they reposted a video of him talking and they started to like pick things apart about like this little tiny mole on his face and this little scar and they were lining it up and they, you know, would like line up his face. But the real kicker for me was his teeth. Like Pac had really, really messed up bottom teeth, like very crooked. And this guy has like almost the identical same teeth. It's very crazy to and me. And this guy is saying he is Tupac. Yeah. And where does he say he's been? Um, I I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't. I was stuck on that. But then I found <laughs> I found this kid on TikTok. <laughs> I need to stay off of TikTok, you guys. Yeah, okay. I really do. Because this kid is claiming to be Tupac's son. He says that his mom and he has pictures of his mom with Tupac. That they dated, mom got pregnant. But that's easy. Do DNA, DNA. and match it up to the mom. Uh, well, that's what I'm just saying about both is of these Tupac's dudes. Mom still. Well, I'm alive, just. I just. She- I'm just gonna do a shout out to these dudes. Like, please, can you just do a DNA test? Because I need to know. Okay. Like DNA. I just. Yeah. I need to know if Tupac is still. <laughs> But is Tupac's mom still alive? I don't remember. Uh, no, I don't think so. I thought she died. I yeah, she I, thought, I thought she had passed. Yeah. Yes. But I just, I need some confirmation. I need, I just need, you know, I need to know. Inquirer I, minds need to know. Yeah. So please. Um, anybody know these guys? Tell them. Please. Yeah. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Now that you think I've really fallen off my rocker, you know? I'm going to find that TikTok video and put it up. Oh, I'll send it to you. Yeah, Yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah, you guys tell me. Because I promise you, you're going to look at it and be like, (laughs) okay, Gina. (laughs) Okay, Gina. But you got to send the one where they compare it to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So anyway, yeah. Thank you for uh, sticking with us another week if you've lasted this long. (laughs) Thank you (laughs) so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I don't know why they wouldn't. We always have gems at the end. Yeah, that's where maybe that's we need where to the throw the gems at. in the front, but that's you know. where the good stuff's yeah, at. So you know, I mean, who knows? Yeah, um, you get a little murder, you get a little Tupac. What more could you ask for, right? Thank you. Okay, well, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.